Thank you for everyone uh, for coming, everyone here in Salt Lake City, and then we have a number of people joining us from around the country on WebEx, um, and that's why I'm mic'd up and trying to make this all work. Um, for the folks that are on the phone, um, we're going to tell everyone, feel free if you're here in Salt Lake City to interrupt us as we go, answer questions. We want this to be interactive. For those of us, for those folks that are on the phone on WebEx, you can um, type in a question as it comes to mind, so please go ahead and do that. We won't be able to answer questions in real time with the folks on WebEx, but we will get back to you um, following the presentation and make sure that you get all of your questions answered. Um, my name is Ashley Peck. I'm a partner here in the Salt Lake City office of Holland and Hart. My practice focuses primarily it's regional practice, both here in Utah and all around the West, focusing on uh, primarily water quality permitting litigation enforcement. Um, and I work with a number of folks here in the room. I'm glad to see you today. And then I have two colleagues here that will introduce themselves. Hi, um, my name is Tim Bagshaw. I'm an associate here in um, the Salt Lake City office. I work with Ashley a lot, uh, also on water quality issues in Utah and also throughout the Mountain West. Um, also do permitting due diligence for mainly energy transactions, but also some conventional transactions uh, as well. And then work on contaminated properties. Those are my sort of three areas. My name is Allison Hunter, and I am from the Boise office. Uh, my practice, I also do a lot of water quality. Um, in addition, uh, environmental litigation, NEPA, ESA, Clean Water Act. Um, and then I do a lot of work for mining clients, so permitting both Clean Water Act and uh, other issues that come up there. And then the other kind of subset of my practice is uh, OSHA defense um, and compliance. Um, so we'll go ahead and get started. Our topic today is, is I think, emblematic of, of all the goings on in the Clean Water Act right now. We are um, going to focus on the federal side because there is so much change or change attempting to happen on the federal side. There's a lot going on at the state level too, but we have folks from all over the West in different states, so we'll keep it to the federal for now. Um, where's my advancer? Here we go. So um, Clean Water Act has been a big priority in this administration, and we've seen quite a pendulum swing from the prior administration to this one. Um, a lot of rhetoric about what, um, what the Clean Water Act regulation, criticism on both sides. <laughs> so we included some of that. But, but um, the Clean Water Act has been a priority of the administration from the beginning with several ad executive orders at the beginning of the administration and a lot of rulemaking that we'll talk about today. Um, I want to do an introduction before we get into the specifics. We're going to cover uh, jurisdiction under the Clean Water Act, which is waters of the U.S. I'm sure a lot of you have heard that in the news. Um, Section 401, water quality certifications, and then um, groundwater and jurisdiction over groundwater. Those are the three primary topics we're going to cover because there's a lot of movement and change happening at that level. But we want to do a quick introduction um, to administrative law because it is what, um, what the agencies have to deal with in terms of the legal standards and the process in order to make these changes. And it's important, particularly in the context of judicial review of a lot of the things we're going to talk about today. Um, so regulatory reform is, is something that's really being talked about, but it is easier said than done. It is a long process process. Uh, notice and comment processes under the Administrative Procedure Act have to be followed, and a rulemaking has to be supported by a robust record. And you really, as an administration, can't shortcut that process if you want a rule to withstand judicial scrutiny. Um, this is the standard uh, under the APA for, for all agency rules at the federal level. And basically, an agency has to build a record and to explain its decision and, and include a rational connection between the facts found and the choice made on a policy level. So that when any of these rules are going up to the district court, the appellate court, the Supreme Court, this is the standard that they're looking at. Um, the standard is a little different when you have an about face from one administration to another, and actually for a rulemaking, the standard is higher. So you can't just say, oh, just kidding about everything we talked about for the last five years as EPA, new EPA, we're going to do things different. You really, um, the, the agency has to provide a more detailed justification in its record for why um, why the change is being made. Um, that's, that's the case for rulemaking. For Guidance, interpretive rules and guidance, the, the uh, standard is a little lower, and that's why we'll see EPA making a lot of changes through guidance as well, because the, the standard isn't quite um, as stringent. 
Um, so guidance and memos, we'll talk to some of the changes that are being made, are being made through guidance and memos. They can, make, they can provide immediate change so they have that benefit where they don't have to go through a years long rulemaking process, but they are limited in scope and they don't, they aren't binding um, on delegated programs to the states. So um, I'm going to talk about WOTUS. I've been talking about WOTUS, Waters of the U.S., for my entire career now <laughs> since I got out of law school. Um, but, but it's important for, for the Clean Water Act because it defines the jurisdictional reach of every program under the Clean Water Act. So um, Section 402, MPDS permits, Section 401, water quality certification, and Section 404, wetland, um, primarily, plus your water quality standards. For those of you who are in the oil and gas space, the Oil Pollution Act is also defined by this, this uh, regulatory definition. And the reason for all the confusion is the vagueness in the statute. So these are, these are the policy goals of the Clean Water Act straight out of the statute. Um, it references navigable waters, and that our goal is to uh, eliminate the discharge of pollutants in navigable waters by 1985. Well, that didn't quite happen. We're still working on that. Um, and then navigable waters is defined very helpfully in the statute as waters of the United States, including the territorial seas. So beyond the, that definition, that reference to waters of the United States, there's nothing further provided in the statute itself defining what that means. Um, so we've had a lot of litigation about this, a lot of seminal cases that have gone up to the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court has repeatedly urged um, and pleaded with both the core of engineers who implements the Section 404 program and EPA who implements the rest of the programs to def define this through rulemaking. So we've had a lot of attempts at that. The, the case, um, the seminal case, the last case to go up to the Supreme Court on this is, is the Rapinoe's case. And it's worth mentioning because it's, it's still in play and different parts of that decision are being cited by different administrations as the controlling law here. Um, very split decision. It was a 4-4 and then um, one, one concurrence vote. Um, the four-vote majority was written by the late Justice Scalia, and it focused on whether or not a waterway had regular flowing water in it and, and a surface water connection to, um, to have jurisdiction under the Clean Water Act. And that's important because, as we'll see with the Trump administration, that is really the focus of their rulemaking. Um, the deciding fifth vote um, for the plurality came from uh, Justice Kennedy, who's now left the court as well. And that focus in his decision, he joined the majority, but his plurality decision was, is viewed as the controlling decision, has been viewed as the controlling decision by the district courts under a long line of jurisprudence as the controlling decision. And his focus was really a site-specific determination as to whether or not a waterway had a significant nexus between a more um, traditionally navigable water. So those, um, those definitions are coming into play in the, in the rulemaking. Um, so what, what is the real um, controversy with, um, with waters of the U.S.? It's not um, whether or not the Jordan River is a navigable waterway or whether or not the Colorado River, your bigger waterways, um, those for the most part are are referred to as traditionally navigable waters. There's not a lot of dispute as to whether or not the Clean Water Act applies to them. It has from the inception of the statute. What, what, where the controversy lies is jurisdiction over tributaries, so smaller waterways that feed into those large waterways, adjacent waters, and actually adjacent waters or adjacent wetlands. So whether or not waters that are, how close are they to these traditionally navigable waters for them to have jurisdiction? For, for the Clean Water Act to reach them, and then other uh, further removed waterways. Um, and then there, um, there's a lot of disagreement over exemptions and what should be exempt and what should be covered under that. So those are the real um, focus areas. Um, just to go over the quick history of, of the rulemaking here, EPA issued guidance in 2003, 2007, 2008, and 2011. Those guidance documents are still in play. That's what the core um, is looking to when they do jurisdictional determinations now. Um, or actually changed a little bit with all the litigation over the rules, so we'll talk about that. And then um, the way this all started is the guidance was withdrawn and the Obama administration finalized its rule in June of 2015. So that rule was immediately stayed um, nationwide and then it, it's been appealed how many dozens of courts? <laughs> 
four years of litigation since um, since that rule was finalized. It was appealed immediately, both in the district courts around the country as well as the appellate courts. There was a jurisdictional fight that went all the way up to the Supreme Court as to whether or not the district court should review that rule or the appellate courts, circuit courts. That, well, the Supreme Court ultimately found that jurisdiction lied in the district courts. So we have, I think, it's more than a dozen um, district court cases going on around the country looking at the Obama administration's rule and the substance of that and whether or not it complies with the law. Um, so that's still happening. And then meanwhile, um, the new administration came in, issued an executive order very early on saying that they were going to repeal the 2015 Obama rule and then um, implemented a two-step process to do that. So the first step um, that they implemented was an attempt to rescind the prior administration's rule, which is always a little dicey from a legal perspective. They, um, they issued a rescission rule uh, in January 31st of last year, end of last year. Um, that rule was immediately uh, appealed. It would, it purported to postpone the applicability of the 2015 rule through 2020. Um, it was appealed already. It's already been, that, that portion of the rule has been overturned by the courts. So two courts in South Carolina and Washington both enjoined, and actually there's a third that joined in, I think, recently, but both of those courts um, vacated and enjoined the attempt to rescind, finding that there were procedural defects with that. Um, the administration appealed those and has recently, in the last couple months, um, withdrawn those appeals. So the, the result of that is that the rule is in effect in certain states, and it's been enjoined in other states, depending on whether or not your state is involved in the litigation. So it's, it's a checkerboarded mess, basically. <laughs> we'll, we'll show you the checkerboard at the end of this. But I'm, I want to get into the, the particulars of, of the rule. We're not going to get into the, the particulars of the 2015 rule, except to sort of juxtapose the big differences, because there are significant differences between the jurisdictional reach under both administrations. Um, so the replacement rule, um, and, and we're going to focus the large rule, lots of detail in it, but we'll focus on the primary primary issues that are likely to be controversial in the litigation. So as I said, traditionally navigable waters is is has long been a settled thing. Your larger waterways are, are regulated under the Clean Water Act, and they're referred to as traditionally navigable waters. There has been some. Um, comments that have been made in the recent rulemaking that have tried to, to pare that back a little bit too, that's unlikely to hold. So um, the, the focus really is on tributaries to those traditionally navigable waters. So waterways, smaller waterways that flow into them. The, the current administration, the proposed rule, and the proposed rule I should say was just um, the public comment period on that rule just ended in April. So the agency is in the process of reviewing the comments on that now. So it has not been finalized. Um, is aim they're aiming to finalize that by the end of this year, but um, it's, it's still in flux. But the proposal is to only include river streams and channels that contribute flow to a traditionally navigable water in a typical year. So that means um, there is a surface water connection, and the real focus and what they're, they're looking to for that, um, that test is that Scalia uh, decision in the Rapinoe's case that we talked about earlier. So the big, the big issue here is that it would exclude jurisdiction for ephemeral waterways. We have a lot of ephemeral waterways in the West that only flow when it rains or we've had significant rainfall events. So the, the rule here um, proposes to eliminate jurisdiction from those waterways, which is a really big deal, particularly here in the arid West. I have a lot of clients that have MPDS permits that, that are for discharge into waterways that don't flow most of the year. They flow, you know, four or five months out of the year, maybe two or three months out of the year in the desert. But those have historically, even back from the Reagan administration, been considered jurisdictional and have been regulated. So this change is significant. It'll, um, it'll be the subject of a lot of controversy, a lot of argument in the litigation. But that's the proposal right now. Um, the Obama administration rule, just to, to say that, because that is still in litigation, was much broader. Um, it, it would have regulated um, any tributary that contributed flow, period. Um, at, at any time, any flow. Um, so there's a big difference between that. 
here in um, nationwide, the estimate is that it will eliminate jurisdiction for 20% of streams that used to be regulated under the Clean Water Act. Um, here in the arid west, it's probably a much higher percentage of the streams that, that are here. So that's tributaries, and um, the, other, the other big fight is on adjacent wetlands. How far away does a wetland area have to be to a traditionally navigable water to be regulated under the Clean Water Act? Because a lot of you who deal with wetlands regulation now, there's that reach, you can get a different decision out of the core depending on the core region because it is a site, has been a site specific test historically. Um, both the Obama administration and the Trump administration are trying to put, a, have both tried to put a finer line on that to make it more predictable. Um, the, the test under the current proposed rule from the Trump administration is that any, any wetland to be jurisdictional under the Clean Water Act must actually touch or abut. Um, a traditionally navigable water or have a direct hydrological surface connection to a traditionally navigable water. So that's also a very significant pairing down. Uh, a lot of wetlands have a subsurface connection to a, a traditionally navigable water and have been regulated because of that. This, um, by the core and the, the EPA's own estimates, would reduce jurisdiction for at least 50% of the wetlands in the country that have been regulated historically. So it'll be, a, it's a controversial move um, and it's it, it we will see <laughs> if it sticks um, but that that's the current proposal it's just is, is you know your waters that have direct surface water connections in a typical year and have uh, direct hydrological connection um, again I think we, we put a little bit of juxtaposition to the Obama administration's rule which would have extended jurisdiction to a geographic reach um, within within a, a, the ordinary high water mark and um, floodplain of traditionally navigable waters, and this is a much more restrictive test. And then other waters. Um, the, the Obama administration's rule really put a site-specific test, so you had your tributaries, your other wetlands or other waters, adjacent wetlands and other waters, and then there was a possibility for jurisdiction to extend beyond that to other waters that would have a direct, um, that would have a hydrological connection to, um, to traditionally navigable waters. And it was really a site-specific significant nexus test under that rule. The, the Trump administration's rule pretty much eliminates that test and, and, and puts in place a kind of rebuttable presumption that there would not be jurisdiction for those waters. Um, so that is also a significant change. Uh, the exclusions in the rule are also a big focus of, of the regulated community. The waste treatment systems exemption, this was um, this is an exemption that was in the Obama administration rule. It's an exemption that's been um, a construct under the Clean Water Act for a while. The big change in the Trump administration's rule is that it applies to waste treatment systems that are built in jurisdictional waterways. So that is a big impact on mine sites. Um, other industrial sites that may actually dam up a small stream use that as a waste treatment system. This, this rule is fairly broad in that exemption and um, has been challenged already um, and will be challenged going forward. Stormwater control features, uh, water filled depressions, the language of all of these is, is a little different under the Trump administration's rule and will be a focus in the litigation. Um, but the big one in terms of exclusions and significant impact is, is ephemeral features. Um, your waterways that, that don't flow year round are being exempted under this rule. So, um, what does it all mean? This is, this is the current checkerboard effect that we have as a result of the Obama administration's rule being under appeal in all over the country. So the blue states um, are where the WOTUS, the 2015 Obama administration rule is currently in effect. Um, 23 states at this point, and that's changed in the last couple of weeks even as a result of elections in some states where the state was involved in litigation that had enjoined the rule in their state, and then in Colorado and New Mexico, there was a political change, and those new state governors have pulled those states out of the litigation, thereby imposing the rule and, and limiting themselves from the injunction. So Colorado, and there's been a lot of change in the last few months uh, because they pulled out of the litigation, and now the WOTUS rule springs into effect in Colorado, and it's, it's slowed a lot of permit processes and put 
um, things on hold for a while. I know some of some folks on the phone and here are dealing with that. New Mexico is even more complicated because the state was involved and then state pulled out, but a number of counties are wanting to get involved in the litigation, so it's potentially some counties it will be in effect and some counties it, it won't be in effect in New Mexico. So that makes it difficult to operate there right now if you're wanting jurisdictional determinations. Um, so this is my very cynical slide. <laughs> I think where where are we headed on this? Um, the the Obama the Trump administration's rule, as I said, just concluded a comment period this spring, so April 2019. They received um, about 11,000 comments, which is a steep decline from what um, the public comment process during the Obama rule, and there was over 100,000 public comments on that. Um, there's a lot of criticism about the time frame. There was only a 60-day comment period. A lot of the interest groups and industry groups are arguing that wasn't a sufficient time frame to actually get a robust public comment process process. So that's a procedural issue that will come up in the litigation. Um, the administration is trying to finalize this rule by the end of this year, though. So they're going through the public comments. They have to respond to those in the final rule. They'll, they'll issue a final rule. It will immediately be appealed. Um, and it will, there will be moves for injunctions. So it, it likely could be enjoined and will have a continual checkerboard effect going on throughout the country. The, the complicated part of that, too, is that we have two, we will have two rules being litigated at the same time, uh, most likely. Um, only one court has issued a real final decision on the Obama administration's rule, and what it's found is that the, there were procedural defects to, with it, and it's re enjoined that rule and, um, and remanded it back to the agency in those states. But there has not been a substantive ruling on whether or not the Obama administration's rule complies with the law. That yet to happen. The litigants are trying to push that process forward, obviously, to make it happen sooner, um, because it's it, it's very likely that we'll have the two rules being litigated at the same time. And that makes it difficult as a litigant, because some of the arguments on procedure that are being made in the Obama rule are arguments that will come up in the Trump administration's rule, and the inconsistency between those is, is a real vulnerability for the litigants. So it's, it's kind of a big mess. Um, with WOTUS right now, I think, um, but the, the the one certainty is that despite all of this change and all of the rulemaking changes, the law has stayed pretty much the same in terms of the way the Corps is implementing these things. So um, in the states where the rules sprung into effect, um, the, there there have been changes, but it's, it's not that much different than the way the Corps was implementing the guidance before. Yeah. I apologize that this is kind of a, uh, an elementary question, but wouldn't the EPA be defending both those rules? Or are they, I mean, how is, who's defending the, that They out? are, they are defending both of the rules. Um, they've, and, um, <laughs> It's it's a dicey thing. So they're they're in the litigation. Whether they're defending, they're they're, they're not mounting a robust defense of the Obama administration's rule. They would they would have preferred to rescind it, right, and not have this checkerboard effect happening while the rulemaking has happened. The courts have found that that was procedurally deficient. They couldn't do that, so they're in the awkward position of being involved in the litigation. Um, that litigation is really being pushed by the other litigants besides EPA in terms of the defense of the Obama administration's rule. The environmental groups obviously like that rule better. They're defending that rule, um, and they're opposing the Trump administration's rule. The industry groups are doing the opposite. And then the states are just in the middle of all of it. Um, the states, a lot of the states have appealed the Obama administration's rule, but there are concerns with the, the Trump administration's rule from a state perspective as well. Um, and that's one of the things that I think is likely to come up in the litigation argument that will be compelling with uh, the Trump administration's rule, and that is that this ratcheting back of jurisdiction and, you know, removing jurisdiction from a lot of waterways that states that have delegated authority have been regulating creates a big problem for the states. Whether or not you agree with the substance of that, if they want to regulate those areas that they have been regulating, that requires the states to put in place their own, you know, gap-filling law to do that. And a lot of the states in the comments on the Trump administration rule have argued that there needs to be an implementation period for that. You know, they need a couple years if they want to catch, you know, fill in the gaps. And so that 
um, that, that hasn't been answered at that, this point, but it will likely come up in the litigation and maybe, maybe something that is really looked at as the courts as a potential problem. So, um, so groundwater, I didn't get into it. It's addressed in the rule, but there's a lot of litigation going right now that Tim's going to cover um, that, that kind of dovetails with, with jurisdiction under the Clean Water Act. Yeah. Let's talk about groundwater, which admittedly is an unusual topic for a Clean Water Act development presentation because, um, as you know, typically um, the Clean Water Act does not govern groundwater. That's a state law issue. Um, the Clean Water Act typically governs, governs surface water. So. Um, but in the last year, we have four circuit court cases, all in 2018, that address the question of groundwater as uh, whether the Clean, Clean Water Act has jurisdiction over groundwater in a particular way. Um, typically, what you see uh, is that a party requires a permit. When we talk about a permit, we're talking about a Section 402 NPDES permit um, for discharges of pollutants into a jurisdictional, from a point source, into a jurisdictional water. Um, the, the easy way to think about this is a discharge of a, of a pollutant, say, from a pipe directly into a river, right? So there's a, a direct connection between the discharge from the point source and then the receiving jurisdictional water. But what happens if the discharge is into the groundwater and then the groundwater carries the pollutant into a jurisdictional water. So it tethers that direct connection between the, the discharge and the receiving water. Um, and, ha and so we're asking about whether this indirect connection through a groundwater conduit is governed by the Clean Water Act. And so that's what we mean by the conduit theory. The, so these four cases I was mentioning, um, all in 2018, uh, address the question of whether this indirect connection, whether the Clean Water Act governs this indirect connection between the pollutant and the receiving jurisdictional water. Let's see. There we go. Here are the four cases. Um, the first one actually just bears mentioning Hawaii Wildlife Fund versus County of Maui. That's the case that the Supreme Court is going to hear this term. So all these cases, it's, it's a hot topic. It's actually in a rapid rise for this issue. Like I said, all these cases are from 2018 and the Supreme Court is already hearing um, is already going to review one of these cases, the County of Maui case. And I think it bears going into a little bit of detail about these cases. You can see the distinction in how the courts have resolved these issues. We have a circuit split, okay? So uh, the, the Ninth Circuit and the Fourth Circuit have adopted this idea that the, that the Clean Water Act does govern this indirect connection. And then the Sixth Circuit has decided it does not. So in County of Maui, the Hawaii Wildlife Fund versus County of Maui case, that involved the, so County of Maui, Maui operated four um, wastewater treatment injection wells. They injected their waste, wastewater, treated, treated wastewater into these injection wells. And then what ended up happening is ultimately that wastewater, 64% of what they injected actually ended up migrating through a groundwater conduit out into the Pacific Ocean. Um, and how do they know this? They did a tracer dye study, which which showed that um, it took 84 days for this, for this wastewater to, to migrate. And then, like I said, 64% of it actually ended up in the Pacific Ocean. So what you've got here is two elements of, of uh, jurisdiction are satisfied immediately. The idea that, a, so the injection well is a point source and the Pacific Ocean is a jurisdictional water. But it's not a direct connection, right? It had to go through the groundwater conduit. And so the court asked that, sort of considered that question, does that indirect uh, connection satisfy the, clean, satisfy the Clean Water Act requirements? And they, they held that it did, because the plain language of the statute um, did not require a direct connection. So they did this analysis of the plain language and said, nothing in, the, nothing in the statute requires a direct connection. So this indirect connection, so long as the relationship is fairly traceable, that's the evidentiary standard. If the point source pollutant um, that ends up in the jurisdictional water, if, if that addition to the jurisdictional water of a pollutant is fairly traceable to the point source, then that will satisfy that, then that, that discharge is governed under the Clean Water Act. Um, in that case, it's going to be heard by the Supreme Court. They're going to review that this term. The other case um, in which a circuit has adopted the conduit theory is this Upstate Forever versus Kinder Morgan case. And in that case, you had a point source that was a, a gasoline, underground gasoline pipeline that ruptured. And then the plume of gasoline migrated again through a groundwater conduit into a nearby jurisdictional water. So again, you had the two elements, clearly a point source and clearly a jurisdictional receiving water, but again, an indirect connection through this groundwater conduit. 
And this court also accepted, uh, also endorsed or um, adopted this conduit theory saying that indirect connection, um, even though the connection is indirect, the, the Clean Water Act does govern in that case. But in that case, so in, in County of Maui, the relationship had to be the evidentiary standard was fairly traceable. Here, the court said that the relationship um, had to be a direct hydrological connection. And so I don't know if those necessarily are, are different. It seems like fairly traceable is maybe a slightly more lenient standard um, than is direct hydrological connection, but we don't quite know yet um, whether that's true. Um, and then the other thing about this case that's actually pretty important is this idea of the ongoing, um, the, the ongoing violation uh, problem. Now, under the Clean Water Act, you can have a you can in, you can have a citizen suit. So anybody, you, you or me, can can as long as we have standing, can sue to enforce the Clean Water Act if there's an ongoing violation, uh, an ongoing discharge, basically. And the court said that is an issue in this case because right after the rupture in the pipeline occurred, um, Kinder Morgan fixed it. So there was not an ongoing discharge, but the ongo but there was an ongoing um, not an ongoing discharge from the point source but there was an ongoing addition of pollutants to the jurisdictional water because that plume continued to migrate over time. And so the question is, does that satisfy the ongoing, um, ongoing violation provision? And the court held that it did. The issue for ongoing violation is not whether the discharge from the point source is ongoing, but rather whether the addition to the jurisdictional water is ongoing. So in this case, it was. And so, they satis so that satisfied the ongoing uh, violation provision and they were allowed to maintain the, the lawsuit. And so those are the two cases that have endorsed or adopted the conduit theory. And then one case, <clears throat> excuse me, the Sixth Circuit has declined to do so. So again, in that, so in that case, you had a coal ash, uh, a coal-fired power plant and some storage ponds for the coal ash. And then from there, obviously, there's some seepage into the groundwater again. Um, the, the pollutants then migrate through a groundwater conduit into a receiving jurisdictional water. And the, the court in that case, the Sixth Circuit said, no, um, we're not going to adopt the groundwater, uh, the, the conduit theory, because again, they, so they, they interpreted the plain language of the statute differently from the Ninth Circuit and the Fourth Circuit by saying that um, the, the statute requires an addition into a jurisdictional water and that into implies a direct connection. So they did not want to tether that direct connection between the point source discharge and the receiving water. And so that court said, no, we're not going to endorse the, uh, the conduit theory. So there's your circuit split. And the court, the Supreme Court is going to resolve this um, in 2019, at least we expect it to. Um, and it's not clear what they do. You know, obviously, if they accept the conduit theory, the question will be, what's the evidentiary standard going to be? Are they going to adopt fairly traceable? Are they going to adopt direct hydrological connection? Or are they going to adopt some different evidentiary standard? We just don't know yet. Um, and then one other case I want to mention, which is called Sierra Club versus Virginia Electric and Power Company. This is, again, the Fourth Circuit. So remember, the Fourth Circuit is the upstate uh, forever uh, court that, that uh, adopted the conduit theory. And I think this is instructive. This case is instructive because it gives you a sense of I think what the end game is for the citizen suits attorneys, because what, what they did here is they tried to extend the conduit theory from what is an obvious point source. So in upstate forever, it was a ruptured pipeline, sort of a paradigmatic point source. But in this case, it was, again, um, a, a, a coal ash um, storage facility. So again, you had the, the, the seepage from the, of the pollutants from the coal ash into the groundwater, and then from there migrated to a jurisdictional water. So the Fourth Circuit, which had already uh, adopted the conduit theory, addressed whether you could have a discharge from a, from a storage facility. And there, uh, the court said, no, we're not going to extend that this far, because they said that the, the, the uh, storage facility, the, the coal ash pile, was not, or, or um, storage pond, was not a point source. Um, so remember, you always have to have a point source, a jurisdictional water, and then a connection between the two. And here they said it's not a point source because a point source is defined as a discrete, um, discernible conveyance, like a pipe. Uh, whereas the storage pond, in this case, it's, it's not a discrete, a discernible conveyance. The, the discharge to the groundwater is through seepage, a diffuse seepage, as, as opposed to a discernible conveyance. And so they said, we're not going to, we're not going to extend the conduit theory to uh, basically storage facilities. But you can see what the, the goal here was, is to get the courts to adopt the conduit theory and then from there try to extend the conduit theory 
to uh, coal ash fire, uh, power plants and other types of, you know, tailings, ponds, and other types of facilities like that. But the court has put a put a um, kibosh on that. So, key considerations under the conduit theory. First, is there a discharge of pollutants from a point source? So we talked about that. Sometimes there's obvious point sources, like the pipeline, like the injection well. Um, but they would not, as we mentioned, they would not, the courts would not extend that to um, tailings piles, storage facilities, that, that type of thing. So that's, that's a, a key question. Secondly, is there an addition of pollutants to a jurisdictional water? That's obviously, uh, again, a key element to Clean Water Act jurisdiction. Um, finally, or sorry, third, is there a demonstrable hydrological connection between the point source discharge and the addition of pollutants to a jurisdictional water? Um, again, you can't just surmise that there's a connection between the discharge and the receiving water. There has to be, that you have to demonstrate, allege some direct connection or um, a hydrological connection. So under the County of Maui case, the question is whether it's fairly traceable. Under the Upstate Forever case or Kinder Morgan case, the question is whether there's a direct hydrological connection. And the Supreme Court will resolve that evidentiary standard likely as well. And then finally, is the violation ongoing such that the alleged violation can support a citizen suit? Again, you can't support a citizen suit unless the violation is ongoing. And so that is a question that's always going to get asked if, it's a, if we're talking about a citizen suit enforcement of the Clean Water Act. Um, so those are the four key considerations. Um, one wrinkle to this is that after the Supreme Court granted cert in the County of Maui case, EPA re um, released what they're calling an, an interpretive statement um, in which they effectively sided with the Sixth Circuit saying we do not endorse the conduit theory. There has to be a direct connection between the point source discharge and the receiving water. Um, and this is an about face from EPA's previous um, views on this. So before the interpretive statement, um, they said in some circumstances, uh, a NIPTES permit may be required uh, for hydrolog hydrologically connected um, discharges. But after the interpretive, state, uh, interpretive statement, they basically did a 180, saying no, in no circumstances, um, uh, in no circumstances will, will, will we enforce indirect connections between the discharge and the jurisdictional water. And then they've also told us that there's going to be a rulemaking after the Supreme Court decides the county of Maui, they're going to go through formal uh, notice and comment rulemaking to formalize that interpretive statement. So that'll be EPA's policy, at least we expect it to, to move in that direction formally. Um, consequences of this interpretive statement. So the, because the, the, the circuit courts in the Fourth and Ninth Circuit have uh, adopted the conduit theory, the indirect connection theory, um, this interpretive statement will not apply in those circuits, but will apply everywhere else. So again, you have this sort of interim um, predictability and clarity, not uniformity, of course, it only applies in some circuits and not others, but at least if you, if you are in the Fourth Circuit and Ninth Circuit, you know what the rule is, and if you're not, you know what the rule is, at least until the County of Maui case gets decided. And then what's the impact of the interpretive statement on the County of Maui case? You know, generally, if EPA comes out with a, with a statement, guidance, a rule, uh, an interpretive statement of this kind, the court will defer to its judgment because it's the authoritative interpreter of the statute that it, that it implements. But in this case, it's not clear what level of discretion the, um, the Supreme Court is going to give to this interpretive statement because it, it's such an about face, right? The, they, they change from a 180 degree, they change 180 degrees from saying that the, the conduit theory was, was appropriate in some cases to saying it's never appropriate to enforce in this, in this respect. So this one, 180 degree turn might give the court some pause as to what level of discretion to give it when it's deciding. Um, when it's deciding Maui. So I was just going to add, you might ask yourself why does this matter? Um, because groundwater is regulated by the state. Um, you can't just put things into groundwater without a permit from the states already. That's already a thing. Um, and most of these programs under the Clean Water Act are delegated to states. Um, the real focus here by the citizens groups is citizen suit liability. Um, there's no ability to enforce against, um, under most state statutes, a uh, violation of the groundwater laws or the groundwater permitting process under state law. 
So what the Clean Water Act gives you is the citizen pursuit provision that Tim alluded to, where a citizen can step into the shoes of a regulator and enforce this. So it, it, a lot of the litigation has been focused on coal ash. Coal ash is a big uh, regulatory issue right now, um, and impacts to groundwater are the focus there. So it's the ability to get at enforcement um, on a federal level that is, is the real thing that the, the citizens groups are after. And of course, the, the standards for a groundwater discharge and groundwater standards are different than surface water standards, so that's a potential implication in a permitting process, too, is more rigorous, stringent standards. So, so that's jurisdiction. I think we're going to move on uh, to switch cards a little bit to 401 because we have some recent guidance that um, just hot off the presses on Friday that Allison got to dig through and decipher for all of us. Um, and this is something that has been talked about for a while as coming and, and finally came out last week. So, yes. So, yeah, on Friday, um, uh, the administration issued new Clean Water Act guidance. Um, and this guidance is directly responsive to the executive order in April, uh, which requires the EPA to take a look at its guidance, at its regulations, um, and with an eye towards more efficient permitting of energy projects and bringing them into compliance with recent court decisions. Um, and that's kind of unsaid, but specific court decisions, because there's other court decisions that uh, this guidance is not in line with. Um, so the three main topics that the guidance covered, and again, these are directly things that the executive order told EPA to look at, um, are timelines for review and action of 401 certification, the scope of state authority to condition or deny a 401 request, and then the scope of information that the state or authorized tribe um, can need for its review. Allison, can we just back, just for those of you who aren't as familiar with 401, because I think in some states it's much more prevalent than others, less so here in Utah, um, 401 gives a state or a tribe the ability to certify um, and have the certification on, on any federal permit that is issued. So a NEPA process, a 404 process, um, it has to be an underlying federal permit that triggers this, but then allows the state to come in and review that process for compliance with its water quality standards. So it can be, it can be a big power and a big issue and big complicated projects, and that's why this is, um, this is happening. Right, right. So, yeah, the Clean Water Act Cooperative Federalism um, wants to bring the states in on this process. And, and in some states, the other kind of underlying, underlying piece of this is um, some states, there's been complaints, have been um, using this authority, abusing this authority to deny projects that are potentially politically unpopular. Um, so, for example, in Washington and New York, there's been uh, recent projects, energy um, development projects, pipelines, and coal that have been denied by the state and based on, um, largely based on, uh, conditions that don't really have to do with water quality. So climate change or air quality issues. Um, so that's, that's where these issues that the executive order is, is seeking clarification on comes from. It's really in direct response to what um, some states are doing in denying or conditioning 401 certification. And also this guidance, I'll just add, um, supersedes guidance uh, that was issued in 2010 under the Obama administration. So um, it's immediately effective, but it is guidance, so it is, um, that doesn't have the force and effect of law. So timelines. Uh, the Clean Water Act says that the state has to act on a request for 401 certification within a reasonable time, but no longer than a year. Uh, the change is that under this current guidance, the timeline begins when uh, the state receives the certification request. Previously, under the last guidance, it was based on them receiving a complete application. So you can see in a specific project where that could um, be very different standards. Um, 
and something some states are going to be pretty pretty unhappy about. But this this is actually consistent with a very recent decision out of the D.C. Circuit. Um, some states have been kind of gaming the one-year limitation by um, having having the project proponent withdraw and then re. Um, submit their application to start the timeline over again. And the DC Circuit said, no, you do that, you've waived your ability to um, issue 401 certification. So, and then the other thing too is, uh, this guidance says that if a state um, takes longer than a year, uh, they've waived it, and anything that they issue condition on, or trying to deny a 401 certification after that point um, has no effect. So the second one, and this is the real kind of hot, hot issue, is um, what is the scope of the conditions that a uh, state can impose? Or conditions the state can impose with 401 certification or the reasons they can deny the certification. Uh, and the guidance says that, you know, it has to be directly related to water quality impacts. Um, so issues under the Clean Water Act, issues, water quality issues under state law. So this is directly going against um, those cases where, where states have denied projects based on air quality issues, climate change. Uh, but as noted, there are court cases that really uh, give states the benefit of the doubt here as far as the types of conditions they can um, place. Uh, Recently, uh, the denial in Washington was upheld by a district court, and I think that was based on, um, I think, both air quality issues and climate change issues. But um, there's older cases where uh, circuit courts have upheld um, conditions like timelines on construction and things like that. So uh, this is really trying to rein in uh, the scope of what what the state can can condition a project on and holding up a project. So the last um, main thing that the guidance addresses is the type of information that um, a state needs to complete their review. And it starts off by saying, you know, the state should only need the application that's been submitted. So. And this kind of goes to, again, there's been, states have been asking for information and that's been one way that people have complained that states have held up the process of final approval of the project, is asking for more information, more information. Um, and the guidance says the state can still ask for this information, but it's not gonna toll the one year timeline. And it also goes into quite a bit about how the state doesn't need um, the NEPA decision documents. Uh, you can make your decision before that. NEPA documents cover a broad range of issues outside of this. They try and um, the guidance also tries to uh, kind of pat the states on the back and say you've got a lot of expertise. You can do it without these things. So, and then I guess to say like there's a couple other more minor issues that the guidance talked about, um, just as far as oh, early collaboration, things like that. But that that's those are the three main ones. Uh, but <clears throat> kind of the implications for this uh, guidance is it gives a real indication of what um, the proposed rule is gonna look like coming from the EPA. Uh, and under the executive order, they gave a timeline, which so far um, the EPA for a uh, federal agency has been moving fairly quickly on this. So under the timeline, under the executive order, um, they're supposed to issue a proposed rule um, by about uh, early August. So that is um, something that you can be expecting to come soon. It's gonna probably look a lot like the guidance on these key issues. Um, so for some states, like Washington and, and New York, um, they're in an interesting position of, of having their uh, practices being inconsistent with this guidance. Um, you know, Washington has just had it upheld by, by the state court there, but in other instances, um, you know, the, gui the guidance says that if a state conditions their uh, denial on something 
outside of water quality issues, then the federal permitting agency should consider whether that actually constitutes a waiver. So states are going to need to think about, you know, do you want to take that step and have the, the possibility of EPA saying it's waiver? Um, but regardless, you can expect uh, more litigation coming from this. So, um, and then also just as far as there's current projects that have gone through uh, these issues of like, oh, we've, we've told the timeline by requesting more information, or we've um, had them resubmit in, in different jurisdictions, and they could come up with EPA right now um, being like, oh, that's a waiver. Like, you're, you're done. I've done that on several projects. We would, we would just withdraw it every year and reapply it the next year. It's a, it's a common practice for big projects with NEPA processes and permitting processes, whether they be hydropower, energy. Um, it's just a reality of some of these permitting processes. They take time, and there's a lot of detail. And so a one-year time frame is sometimes unrealistic if a state really wants to meaningfully weigh in and impose and, and conditions. So, um, all right. So that is, that's a quick overview of three key areas. There's still a lot of, of, of changes. 404, there's, there's been some movement there, not a lot of concrete detail yet. There's new mitigation guidance that um, allows more flexibility for mitigation banking, um, something that you, we, we're happy to talk about in more detail but won't get in today. Um, as a result of the changes that are happening on the WOTUS level and the, the, the narrowing of jurisdiction under 404, a lot of states are looking um, for delegations of 404 authority um, and, and how to fill in that gap if they want to regulate wetlands that wouldn't be regulated under the Clean Water Act. There's, um, for the most part, there's two states in the country that have delegations to issue wetland permits. Um, it, it, for the most part, that's the core in every other state, and there's a lot of talk about more delegation to states generally, and then as a result of this narrowing of jurisdiction of the Clean Water Act and how that will all work out still remains to be seen. And then there's, there's been some movement and litigation on EPA veto authority. Um, before we wrap, I just wanted to mention uh, compliance initiatives um, because these just came out this week. Um, it used to be that EPA would issue uh, its enforcement initiatives. That's what they used to be called. They've changed that to compliance initiatives and just changed that a, a bit more. And, and they every year will put put a focus on certain areas where they were going to enforce previously. Now they're calling it compliance initiatives. There's a steep drop off on enforcement, but in the Clean Water Act or water quality sphere, uh, they are focusing on significant noncompliance with MPDS permits. That was just announced this week. Um, Safe Drinking Water Act is also a big concern um, and has been for the last several years. Community water systems, mines, um, communities, smaller operations that have their own drinking water sources from wells, things like that. There's, a, there's been a focus regulatorily on that, both from the federal level and the state level, and cracking down on noncompliance there and permitting. Um, and then there's accidental reasons, uh, industrial sites and chemical facilities is another focus um, that, that they have just recently announced. Um, enforcement across the board, we just wanted to mention this, is, is down. This is, this is your rates of civil inspections, and this is across all EPA programs. Um, significantly declined in 2018. We don't have the 2019 numbers, but they've also gone down. So um, this is civil enforcement cases and conclusions. Also, the numbers, the numbers are going down. So there is a lot less emphasis on enforcement right now. Um, and then monetary penalties. You can see the number in 2016, 2017 on enforcement cases are pretty high, and that's a wrap up of a lot of enforcement cases that started in the prior administration, the number for 2018 is, is quite low. Um, so what do you do? There's a lot of uncertainty. Um, obviously, we've talked about today a lot of things in flux, and depending on where your operations are, it, it's different. It may be that things have just stayed the same because everything's tied up in litigation. It may be that, that rules, uh, the WOTUS rules sprung into effect. Um, I think our, our, our caution is always be conservative, um, continue compliance, take a conservative approach because you can't really um, count on uh, a lot of these changes sticking because there's a real potential for them to be overturned in the courts and certainly for them to be tied up in the courts for many years. Um, I think with WOTUS especially, it's pretty likely that we'll have litigation in, on both rules 
happening at a time of a, an election, and depending on what happens in the election, there will be big changes as a result of that. And, you know, the, the bottom line is things will st still need to be implemented. We still need permits for projects, and your individual regions are going to be having to grapple with that and figure out creative ways to issue those permits and be compliant with the law. Um, and then finality and enforcement, and then, as Tim mentioned, citizens do are always an issue um, as a state enforcement. That's all we have. We'll be happy to answer questions on any of the topics or, or any clean water questions you have. Anybody? <laughs> sure. I have a question about the, um, the conduit theory. Is the, if you have something like stormwater, is that considered a point source? Goes into the groundwater and then goes into a tributary, a jurisdictional water. Is that a completely separate issue? Is that considered a point source? Because that can potentially be. Uh, no, it's not. It's not a completely separate issue. Now, um, it, 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 stormwater is in play here too. Stormwater is not a, is is a non-point source, but stormwater is regulated through permit. So, um, with the conduit theory, if you had stormwater that's contained on site and is is not having an outfall to surface water, um, that conduit theory could come into play if there were. A, a surface water connect, uh, underground connection. Um, but for the most part, your stormwater permits are for outfalls that that do discharge to surface waters. So, but there's, yeah, there's potential for change to that program as well with us. And, and to follow up on that, so who has uh, the jurisdiction to oversee that? The MS4 or the state groundwater uh, folks? So they have well. <laughs> They don't discharge to MS4. They are discharged to the groundwater, which is water the state. Who regulates that? The state or the municipality? Currently, it'd be the state. Um, because it, as an MS4, you're, 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 you're concerned with your outfalls that go into your stormwater system and that then discharge to surface waters. So that wouldn't be something that you would ordinarily be concerned about because that's not regulated under the Clean Water Act, groundwater. So right now, um, yeah, it's, it's groundwater is, is an area for the state. Could that all change with depending on what the Supreme Court does and what happens in the waters rule? Potentially, yeah. Currently, the state says the MS4 is responsible for those discharges to groundwater. They're saying that now. Whether that's legally correct is probably, um, yeah, yeah. So, yeah. Are you aware of any legal decision on waters of the U.S. for an anthropogenic wetland that discharges to an navigable water? Is that considered jurisdictional? Something completely created. Um, I'm not aware of a decision per se. There could be one that I'm not aware of. I think um, this current rule would not would not for something that was completely man-made. Uh, the prior rule probably would have reached, would have reached something like that, but yeah. I don't know of any cases that are. No, I don't know, yeah. Which is not to say there's not a yeah, jurisdictional be, determination yeah. out there somewhere, there probably is, and there may be more than one and they may be inconsistent, right? <laughs> Depending on which core district you were in, but yeah. All right. Any other questions? We're, we will stick around here after the program, so feel free to come up if you have individual questions about a different water quality topics. Um, but thank you for coming. Um, this, oh, go ahead. The, this um, on the environment series is something we do every quarter. We'll do a different one, and we have our summit, um, Natural Resources and Environment Summit, that we do here in the fall, which is a longer program with a couple different breakout panels that we'll be doing. We'll hope to get some regulators, maybe the new DEQ director here for that this fall, so stay tuned for that. If you're on our mailing list, you'll get an invite. And I save the date for that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank Uh, did, uh, yeah. 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 Y
and he got here about first. Yeah. Fairly trade for Trish Holmes, right? I had been training in Seattle. It's really expensive. I've read a little bit about the back. Yeah, they're exactly here, and they can prove that they're actually here. Yeah, they're, they're, and it is odd. I love it. I'll see the text. I'm glad that it's me. Do you have a plan? Yeah, exactly. Like when he was with us, like, I thought his trajectory was a little bit different. I don't know. I think the court came out. It's hard for them to say, yeah, for sure. Maybe. Oh, they'll get done next year. Yeah. I'll shut my door and they're going to get desperate. 